the lessons and the, the, the decisions that were made at different points in our nation's history about policy, politics, law, and how that impacted my family from generation to generation, cumulatively over time. When the first race laws were being developed, they were developed by the planter class. They were developed by the people who owned the plantation that needed free labor in order to make a profit. This construct of race gets more and more embedded, specifically in order to give white men more money. Well, my hope for you is that through the framework of my family's story, which spans um, several continents, and um, 10 generations, going all the way back to 1682, that you'll be able to enter in, enter into the larger story of race in America, that you will begin to ask the deeper questions of your own story. Welcome, everyone, to our first Book Notes opportunity and conversation. I'm really excited today uh, that we have the opportunity to talk with none other than Lisa Sharon Harper, who is the author of Fortune. You saw uh, the book trailer prior to um, you coming on screen. And I believe that tonight's going to be a discussion that is going to bless you, a discussion that is going to inspire you, a discussion that is going to anger you, uh, but ultimately a discussion that is going to teach us how that how we can repair the world. And so we welcome each of you to uh, tonight. Uh, we want you to know that you can communicate with us through the chat. Uh, there are people who are behind the scenes that you cannot see at this moment uh, who will be taking your questions so that we can share those questions with the author. Uh, this is part of a series of conversations that we're going to be having in February and also in March. And I am just really excited uh, that my friend and sister, Lisa Sharon Harper, uh, will be with us uh, this evening. And so before we begin, we're going to uh, begin in prayer. And uh, Sister Lisa is going to come on screen and we're going to have our conversation. And so I would just simply ask at this time that you would just prepare your hearts at this moment and that we may go to God in prayer. Gracious and most merciful God, in whom we live, move, and have our being, we come this night uh, to have a conversation about history, about all of the challenges from that which is horrific and that which is hopeful. May you bless the conversation that we may walk away and not only inspired, uh, but also meditating on the need and necessity to have a Sankofa perspective that we may look back in order to move forward. We thank you for our ancestors, those who went before us, who faced challenges that we still to this day cannot imagine. We thank you for this moment to be able to have conversation and to elevate their work and witness. We offer this prayer this night. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask uh, that none other than Lisa Sharon Harper will join us at this time. Uh, we are looking forward to the conversation uh, tonight. Lisa. Hello, Pastor. <laughs> so glad that you are with us. I want to let the entire uh, audience know uh, that you are one of the premier uh, writers and advocates and also activists in the country a graduate of University of Southern California, Columbia, a former, uh, former organizer with the Sojourners community. And now uh, you are the founder, CEO, and Imagineer of Freedom Road, uh, LLC, where you are taking people across the country uh, with a curriculum to help, un help us understand how we are to repair and to really shape a country that is 
yet to be, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. And so we welcome you to the Trinity Village. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I love the Trinity Village. I love your work, Pastor. I love your writing, the way you think. And it's always been really fun to be in conversation with you. So I've been looking forward to this all day long. Thank you. I have too. I have too. And so I want to, I have to show the book. Uh, Fortune is the book that we're talking about tonight. Well, let me get that right. Me. Fortune. <laughs> uh, you can pick that up at any bookstore across, across the nation. I'm sure that it will bless you. Now, I want to begin with this way. Okay. is I, I, I'm going back reading your book for like the third time um, because I've seen it in several stages That's as you're funny. working with it. And it's really a genealogical detective story mm. that has its own antagonist and protagonist. Oh, interesting. So, so share with, uh, with us how you came to, to write Fortune. Mm. Well, the research started 30 years ago. Um, I was really just like most African-Americans who start to do our family trees. We're just trying to fill in the blank spots. We're trying to know who we are. And so I had no intention. I had written, I had not written anything when I started doing the research 30 years ago. But in the course of the research, I began to discover some oddities with my family's story. And mm -hmm. those oddities led me to some of the most um, consequential decisions that were made in American history that actually crafted mm -hmm. this thing we call race in our legal structures. And when I realized that, I realized, oh my goodness, this is more than just my story. This is really America's story and the story has to be written. So that's why I sat down to write Fortune. Mm. Yeah. 1670, I mm -hmm. think it's 1687 also. Mm -hmm. Sambo and also Fortune. Yeah. And I, I'm fascinated that you were able to to go that far back. I think it would be important because I'm, there are many people who are watching who also want to know how do you go about learning about yes. your family tree? Yeah. If you could lay out some of the things that you had to do over the over mm -hmm. time to find out about the ancestor from Senegal by the name of Sambo. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, nothing ever happens, at least usually it doesn't happen in one shot. You circle something many times, and each time you find a little bit more detail because there's one more document that comes online that shows you one more thing, or you have another experience that opens it up a little bit more. But for me, the the journey started with Ancestry.com, and actually also, no, I'm, that's wrong. It started with a conversation with my mom. Uh, that's where the, that's where the journey began. I was 1991. I called my mom. I wanted to know who are these people that that you've been talking about and how do they relate to and where do they fit in the tree? So we literally over the phone, sa she sat me down and we actually mapped out the first family tree. And I didn't even have names on that tree. I didn't know that. I mean, that's how much I didn't know. I just knew grandpa lived around this time, died around this time. Great grandpa lived around this time, died around that time. And that also shows you how patriarchal I was because I really didn't trace the women's lines, only the men, only the man, my mom's dad, you know? Um, and, but when ancestry.com came on online, um, that opened up a world of possibilities along with the national archives. So my mom was the first one to go to the national archives. She was there to research Henry Lawrence, her, her first great grandparent. Um, and uh, he's my second great granddad, right? So she thought she might have found him and then she wasn't sure. I ended up going back decades later and I realized it actually might be him. So the one of the Henry Lawrence's that I talk about in the book, because we still haven't fully nailed it down, right. um, is the one that she discovered um, her first time there. But I got a chance to look at all of his records and really examine the, like the medical records from the Civil War, because he fought in the Civil War. And it does sound like he actually, I think it's him. I think that's him. So that is that's how it began. And I began to ask the question. This a big question arose when we were looking um, at the family history of Philip Fortune. Okay. Philip, yeah, Philip Fortune is my second great grandfather, same generation as um, as Henry Lawrence, but you know he was uh, he lived in New York City. Um, he was um, he had Ella Fortune, who was my great grandmother. But I was looking for him on the census. And I had come to expect, as we all would, most African Americans would, that we are not going to find his birth 
um, you know, his birth certificate, that's for sure. And certainly not even on the census if he was born before the Civil War. So you would look for a slave schedule. I could not find a slave schedule that had, you know, anybody near the last name Fortune as the masters. Like, well, what is this? So then all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, that's him. That's Philip Fortune. That's my second great grandfather with his name on the census. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh my gosh. So that means he was free. So I'm like, mom, how was Philip Fortune free? And she goes, <laughs> she says, you know, my grandfather always said that the fortunes were free before the Civil War. They they said they were a little uppity, you know. So I, I and they were very formal people, and and I says, well, Mom, why didn't you tell me that? Well, I don't you know. I just forgot, you know. And so so anyway, we start we start going deeper and deeper, and she's like my partner in this the whole way. She's the one who discovered the connection to Fortune Game McGee, mm. and Fortune Game McGee. Um, was born in 1687, as you said. Her father, Sambo Game, was born in, eight, in 1670. And so somewhere between 1670 and 1687, at, at 17 years old, Sambo was brought to America. Well, we believe we've actually found the ship because there was only one ship, the Speedwell, that came into the port in Maryland from Africa wow. um, in the in the time that he was alive before Fortune was born. Exactly. Now you so found I, the captain also of the ship. Captain Goodhand. Yes. Wow. What a name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Doesn't that just sound like a pirate's name? Captain yeah. <laughs> so he he came on the ship called the Speedwell. Mm. And about a hundred or so people died in that journey, but he did not. Mm. And it was very soon, like really just like a decade. Now, in do you know the, decade, the total number of people on that ship? Yes. Yes. The transatlantic slave voyage database actually has a record of every death ship that came to the, to the Western world from Africa. Yeah, say that again. I want to make sure that in the background they post that. Yeah. And you can get the, you can get the link to it. So somebody Google it and put that in there. The okay. transatlantic slave voyage database transatlantic slave voyage database. And so I, I literally looked through all of them, like just, and I went and you can actually do a, do a sort. So all of the Maryland um, ports of entry, and that's the only one, only one came into the port of Maryland in that time. And that tells you a lot. First of all, it tells you that the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade had not actually yet taken root in North America. It mm -hmm. was very, New, yes, we had we had been bringing people here since 1619, but when they came in 1619, they were not expecting us on the other side. They had never had enslaved people here before, um, and and that was a pirated ship. Um, the White Lion was a warship that pirated Africans off of a, a slave ship that was on its a death ship on its way to Mexico. So those black folk were about to be Mexican, but the white lion took them off that ship and rerouted them to um, to Point Comfort, which is now we understand to be Hampton. That's the, na the name of Hampton. Yeah, say that again so people know that, because I always associated Point Comfort with somewhere down the road, uh, <laughs> but that is now. <laughs> it's now Hampton, and it used to be named, well, actually it still is named Point Comfort, um, but Point Comfort was the place where those first 20 and odd Angolan men were deboarded from the White Lion, which was an English warship. Now get this, John Rolfe was the one who, who greeted, greeted the ship, mm -hmm. who received the ship when it came in. And here's the thing I'm realizing as I'm writing and as I'm uh, you know, also analyzing my own work, I'm thinking, what are the themes? One thing is that there were choices that we made from the very beginning all the way through that got us to January 6th, okay. that got us to the voting rights um, uh, being eviscerated, got us to voter suppression and um, and subversion that's going to be happening, even in my own state in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. in this next election. There are choices that we made. And one of those choices was what John Rolfe did in 1619. He could have, because they had never had slave, slaves before. He could have said, you know what? We're not into that. Turn them back. Take them back where they came from. Send yeah, them for back those who are listening, you know, break down John Rolfe so that they know who you're speaking of. Right. John Rolfe, thank you. John Rolfe was the, the leader of the Jamestown colony. 
And, um, you know, he also, I believe, married uh, uh, Pocahontas, which is, you mm -hmm. know, obviously that's not her name. But um, but he he was the leader. He was the guy. And he's the guy who was standing there at the port when the when the ship came in and received it. And he lied and called it a Dutch ship. He said that it was a Dutch ship so that they um, England would not be would not be held liable for this pirating, basically stealing, you know, on the open seas. And so, so when those 20 and odd came, he could have sent them back. He could have said, okay, we'll indenture them and then send them back if you want to do injustice light, right? Um, but no, he didn't. What he did was he said, okay, we'll take them and we'll use them. Mm. And most of them were indentured, though some of them were also enslaved. But we didn't have a whole lot of slave ships coming into the ports in Virginia, the first colony, and Maryland, the second colony, for the whole first, really, century of enslavement on, on American soil. It was very much still indig um, uh, indentured servitude. There still were a lot of white indentured servants and Native American indentured servants. That, that's important. That's why I love what you do in your book. That, that you lay out and, and make some real clear distinctions in terms of what indentured servitude is, mm -hmm. because there are some people today who, uh, I, I won't go into the CRT piece, but they, they, they are trying to frame indentured yeah. servitude and slavery as something that was not destructive. And your family, uh -huh. your family is connected also to what you would call alter Scots, also, is that the Ulster Scots? Yes. Ulster Scots. Yes. yes. So this is an, it's such a fascinating history. Oh, and by by learning this, what I've started to do is to piece the threads together so you understand how this all happened, right? So around the turn of the what is it, the 16th century, turn of the 17th century, going into the 1600s, um, England um, is now using. Southern Scots, so there's like the Northern Scots, Scott Highlands, and then there's the Southern Scots. They're using Southern Scots, um, taking them over into Belfast, the Belfast area, mm. and using them to plant English plantations in Northern Ireland. So you thought that the IRA was where all this began? Oh, no, 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 no. No, it began around 1600, 1603, mm. 1602, really. So they're, so they're doing the plantation thing over there. So now fast forward around 1682 and the Irish, they've actually already had several uprisings, but this is a major one. They killed 12,000 Ulster Scots. Ulster Scots were the Scots who were brought in to do plantations for the English, right? They killed 12,000 in one day around um, 1683, actually. So, but it had been growing, the tension was growing. And so 1682, Maudlin McGee and George McGee, her husband, get on a boat and they come over to America trying to flee the violence, what they would have called persecution, but what the Irish would have called um, payback or would have called revolution, right? So they're fleeing, they come to America. And about six years later, um, here on a boat, here is brought uh, um, Sambo, is brought on the death ship. And so he comes and within that year, they meet, Maudlin falls in love with Sambo, whose name, by the way, did I tell you this, means second son. Mm. It's, I, mean, that's, I think that's that's really important because we we've used yeah. the term Sambo as a slur, you know, yes. black Sambo. And here you have this Senegalese name mm -hmm. that means just second son. Second son. Mm. It tells you something of his story, right? Mm. Like that's the thing that just oh, when I found that I was ashamed. Actually, I had to say I was like, no, you're not telling me that my ancestor was the first Sambo. Are you saying that? No, no, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But then, right. But then I went to the Whitney Plantation where the education director is Senegalese. And mm. he was talking to us about how there were a lot of people named Samba, Samba, mm. um, that were brought into the Louisiana area. And I asked him, would they have had Sambos? And he said, well, yes, actually, Sambo is a Senegalese name. It's a Wolof name. And, um, and it means second son. So the minute he said that, I said, oh, my gosh. My Sambo, that so all that time I had thought that they changed his name to Sambo, but they had that that practice hadn't even happened yet. They weren't changing their names. He had his name. 
Mm. So even the colonization of our names, that we've taken a name that had beauty, that had power, and had been changed into something that was a slur, that no yeah. one wanted to be called, no one wanted to be a Sambo, when in actuality, you should want to be a Sambo. Yes. Samba. Yes, yes. And that that slur did not really occur until the Jim Crow era when they began mm. to try to try to twist the conception of black people. And the mm. only reason they were able to use it as such a slur is because there were so many second sons. There were so many people named Sambo who had come over from that region of the world. So anyway, getting back to the story. So Sambo comes, he falls in love with Maudlin McGee, has they, you know, they have an affair and a child, and they they name the child Fortune. That, that's, that's, your, I, that's, that's what messed me up reading your book. I mean, the idea that here you have this Senegalese man, yeah. this Scottish woman. Now she's already with somebody, but you know, he yeah. Sambo is the man, he rolls, he rolls over, and they have this child. Yes. Named Fortune. Yes. 1687. 1687. That's mm. right. In Somerset County, Maryland, in the, on the eastern shore of Maryland. And so now the thing is, Fortune was born into a context where race was in the midst of being constructed. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of, I want to go back in order to go forward, right? So we're going to do the Sankofa thing. We're going to look back in order to go forward. Okay. So in order to understand the moment that, that Fortune is in in 1705 when she's hauled into court in order to determine if she's going to be indentured or not, right? Mm. You have to understand 1650, okay? Yes. In Virginia, okay? Mm -hmm. So you follow me, right? So 1650 Virginia, Elizabeth Key is born. Mm. Elizabeth, or not born, I'm sorry. She, she takes a, um, her case to court. She's born in 1630. 1650 at 20 years old, she takes her case to court. She is the daughter of an Englishman named Thomas Key. Thomas Key recognized her as his daughter. And Thomas Key also had her baptized. Now, the thing is, according to English law, right. Right. citizenship, mm -hmm. and, and Virginia is an English colony, citizenship came through the line of the father. And her father was an English citizen. And you could not enslave an English citizen. So she said, I, I shouldn't be able to be enslaved because my father who recognized me is an English citizen and I am too, therefore, so you can't enslave me. And by the way, he had me uh, baptized and you can't enslave another Christian according to your own law. And she won. And a lot of other people followed her and won. And so 12 years later, the House of Burgesses in Virginia says, uh, wait a minute, we're losing all of our free labor. Now they had a choice in that moment. They could have said, okay, you know what? We have a lot of mixed race kids coming up They're They're challenging our whole race based slavery and race based, um, you know, indenture kind of thing. Cause it, the way they did race based indenture is they would, they, everybody got indentured, but the black folk never had a time limit. The black folk, like they never actually put the date of the indenture. So mm -hmm. they were able to keep them in pretty much forever, you know, illegally. So, so they could have done, they said it could have like, phased out indenture. They could have done a fee for service thing at this moment. They could have said, you know what? We're going to we're going to just stop this. This is not who we are. They didn't. You know what these law abiding mm. lawmakers did? They wrote they love the law. They expect they respect the law. So they changed the mm. law. Mm. They changed it. So instead of citizenship status coming through the line of the father as it had forevermore, now they were going to jump to the law of Roman partis, the Roman law yes. of partis. Right. Which, what does Rome have to do with Virginia? I don't know. But they decide to go to Roman law of partis. And under that law, the status of the child goes through the mother. Mm -hmm. And they added the two words in perpetuity, mm -hmm. which is what actually created race-based slavery. Because now, and, and this is the thing I never understood before. I thought it was like, if your mother is a slave, you are a slave. But that's actually not it. Right. If your mother was not a citizen, then you are not a citizen. Mm. And therefore, you are not protected from slavery. You can be enslaved. And it, then it kind of morphed into you are a slave, right? Mm. So, so now you jump over two years later, Maryland, 1664. Um, 
Maryland has the opposite, literally the opposite side of the coin problem. In Virginia, the problem was white men raping their enslaved black women mm -hmm. and producing mixed race kids, which challenged the status question. But in Maryland, the problem was white women, Ulster Scott women like Maudlin McGee and Irish women like Irish Nell, who comes up in 1681, mm -hmm. falling in love and marrying enslaved black men. Mm. marrying mm. and having kids with them. So they like, what does that do? It gets at the ego of those white planters. And it also begins to, again, challenge the status, mm. you know, this, this black white status that had, that had come up. So their way of solving the problem was to say, if any white woman marries an enslaved black man and has children by him, she herself will be enslaved mm. and until her husband's death and her children will be enslaved in perpetuity. Mm. Mm. In perpetuity. So that was 1664. They look up a few years later and they realize, wait a minute. We didn't know this was going to happen. The planters began to force their Ulster Scott women to, and Irish women to marry enslaved black men. Mm. In order, in order to breed free labor in perpetuity wow. from the children. And that's what they did. And so the, the Maryland, um, you know, um, ha General Assembly looks up and says, oh, we didn't mean this to happen. They clutch their pearls. They right. back off a little bit. But you know what they do? They put they put the power. They take the power from the planter to decide who's going to be enslaved and who's going to be indentured. And they place the power in the hands of the church. Mm. And, so and that the really gets at, uh, I heard my father say one time that you start with profit, if it's profitable, yes. you move to the political, and then the tail light is theological. He said, that's the three tiered process for oppression. Start with your profit, go to your politics, and then unethical theological people come at the tail end. That's right. And what what's happened? powerful in your book mm -hmm. is just what you have stated. You shared the connection of gender, of patriarchy. Yes. Wrapping itself entwined with race mm -hmm. and with profit. Yes. Always. Always about profit. Yes. There's never a time when it's not about building white men's mm -hmm. bank accounts. Always, even right now, mansion. That's why we that's why we don't have yeah. voting rights right now. Because oh. mansion is trying to protect his bank account. That's it. Mm -hmm. It is always about money. And I think that that's that's it's instructive because we have been lied to, actually. We've been told, oh, they hate us. Well, some of them do. But it's not even about that. They have, from the very beginning of this of the of the age of conquest, the age of conquest, which is really about colonization, not about hatred of different races. It's about the extraction of resources from different places in the in the world through people who are not like you. So, it's really the issue is not racism. The issue is colonization. Yes. Because right, white supremacy is simply necessary. It's necessary in order to justify extracting the resources from somebody else's land and extracting and that, that people. An interesting, interesting point, because here you have, you're, you're speaking the British Empire in, in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Yes. How you have an island that doesn't have resources. They don't have anything. Nada. They're so desperate. They have rain. That's what they have. They have resources. They need other people to maintain power or to be in power. That's and right. We forget that often when we have these conversations. We just have these very unnuanced conversations about, about race or about slavery or about gender, not realizing the idea of colonization. Right. And what we have is we, when you when you look back, part of the reason that that works, that this is helpful, it's a helpful um, framework through which to, to see this, is that then you can understand 
how this all happened. It's not just a black white thing. It, when yes. you're in Los Angeles, you understand better what's happening and what happened in Los Angeles. It's still it is still suffering under the weight of white supremacy, but it's not a white black continuum. It's not about slavery. It's not about um, the extraction of no cost labor. That's not how white people imagined. Um, uh, first of all, the white people there were Spanish and it's, it just, it complicates the narrative, but it's all the narrative of colonization. Um, and you understand then the extraction or the, the taking of this land um, from Native Americans and the genocide, the logics of genocide that they had to use. We need to erase from them from the land so we can have it. Right. It's not just because we, we don't like them or because we we're even because we're afraid of them. It's because we need and want this land because we don't have any. Mm. And, and also all they ever knew in Europe was domination. Mm. That's all they ever knew. So when they came, they had no imagination for how they could possibly share power. Mm. They didn't have, and they still don't. This is, which is why we have January 6th right now. Come on. Um, I had just a, a quick thought and we can go on to another thing, but I had a deep thought and I had, I actually talk about it in the book um, a few years ago. Think back to the day mm. that, that day, when a white man left Europe and went somewhere else and did not imagine that he should be ruling there, that he could do it better wherever he went. Mm. When was that time? Mm. That's a real question. When was that time? You can't find that time. You have to go back 3000 years to before the, the crusades, <laughs> before the Greek empire, before right. the crusades, crusades. Exactly. Right. So you have to go before the, you have to, before the Greek empire, 3000 years, which means there is no common memory of submission, no common memory of following, no common memory of simply just simply being human, not having to control and define everything and everyone. But could could the challenge be, that just like the, the the British Empire, when you don't have the necessary resources, but you go to places that, that are rich in resources uh, that are not looking to colonize, you raise some questions. <laughs> you, you raise some questions about how do I get in on the Silk Road? You raise, right. you raise some questions about how do I get on the gold trade across the Sahara, the Sahara Sea, as they used to call it. Mm. Uh, you raise some questions. We, we, we don't have these resources whatsoever. So, so you raise some really fast. Now, there's something else that you, you raise that I want the audience to hear. You mentioned, and we, we, we brushed past it, Irish, Scottish, getting married to black men. Um, the yes. other thing is natural allies, but not seeing themselves as allies. No. Mm -mm. Okay, so get this. George McGee, mm -hmm. Maudlin's husband, eventually I think they they disown her. In fact, you can't even find mm -hmm. you can't find George McGee's wife ever mentioned in any of the narratives about him, even in the like the doctoral research, the research wow. from professors that are doing this research, they never mention his wife. And mm -hmm. I think I know why, right? So, and the reason we know he had a wife is because of court documents from the time that named her as George McGee's wife, right? So, um, so George, so we know we know it's there, and somehow she got wrote out, written out of the out of the doc, out of the narrative. But George McGee eventually moves south. He moves um, south through North Carolina, South Carolina, down into Georgia. Okay. And when he gets to Georgia, he changes his last name because he is. Ulster Scott, meaning he is of the plan. He's the one who was planting the plantations on their land. And George, remember, Georgia was a prison colony right. for the Irish. Like it was mostly Irish down there. So he changed his name to McGee, right? M C G E E. Mm. And he and his sons and his progeny become some of the most prolific slave owners and plantation owners in the South, all mm. the way to Texas. From, wow. from Georgia to Texas. And, and so, what you know, they were subjugated. Mm -hmm. the, the Ulster Scots were subjugated people. They were being used by the English to create wealth for the English. Mm -hmm. 
But when they get to America, they simply do as was that was as was done to them, and they do what they were trained to do. Mm. They just get theirs in this this uh, capitalist economy. Now, in this capitalist economy, we're still in the space. As we're mm -hmm. talking about 1700s, we made our way up to about 1705. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's this, a lot more to the book, you guys. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we could talk all night, and, mm -hmm. and I really want people to to really understand the the, the, the origin. But race, the construction of race, mm -hmm. is not finished at this point. It's it's oh, in no. the making. Help, help us out here that it's yeah. in the making. What we understand as race now was not the same idea in 1687 nor in 1705. Yeah, that's right. So so, that, so the thing is and you can see it in the laws because they are they are figuring this out as they go. They're kind of building the plane as they fly it. And so the very first race law in Maryland had only four provisions and one of those provisions was that that the woman would be enslaved, you know, and then the second was her children would be enslaved along with her. There were two more. The next slave law, the the next iteration had like six or seven iter um, you know points. Um by the time that uh, Fortune is standing in front of that court in 1705. She's been hauled into court in order to determine if she's going to be indentured or, or or let go. She has actually, she was born in a very weird moment, a window where there was no penalty at all. And that's a funny story that I'll have to let you read the book in order to get the funny story that made it. She shouldn't have been indentured at all, according to the law that was in effect when she was born. But a law was passed a few years after she was born because Lord Baltimore, the guy who actually, you know, was the Lord over Baltimore, he or over over all of Maryland, he fell out of favor with the General Assembly and technology. And I know you like technology. Mm -hmm. So in 1770, they got they they basically upgraded the ship technology technology. So no longer did they have to make a pit stop in Barbados or somewhere in the Caribbean in order to get up to North America? They could go straight from the western coast of Africa, any of those, any of the slave ports there, all the way to Maryland or even to Boston. Like they were able to go way far up because of a, an, an, um, an acceleration in technology, mm -hmm. which then accelerated the rate of black people filling the colony. Mm. So as black people now fill the colony, and at, at one point in the early 1800s now, black folk are the majority of people in um, in Maryland. And you actually have quite a few free black people who are living in Maryland. But you have more and more and more black folk who are coming in and white folks now are getting very nervous. Does that sound familiar? Mm. Because right now we are in a moment in 23 years in America you are going to have a shift where we have a majority people of color in America. Mm. And at the same inflection point in 16, between 1670 and 1700, white folks started to lose their minds in Maryland when they started to see that they were being outnumbered by black folk. That is when the, the just a, a steady roll of different iterations of the race laws co rolled out. So that by the time that, um, that, Fortune is standing before that court. There's like 25 provisions to the race law. There's like, and they are heinous. I mean, and they, they get more and more brutal because the need to control us becomes more and more um, yes. salient. So Fortune is eventually indentured. She's indentured until she's 31 years old, post haste. Mm. Like she, she lived the first 18 years of her life free, but then she is indentured until she's 31. Wow. And so, and and here's the thing, because of the iterations of the law, the law always protected and never penalized only one person or people group within the Maryland community, white men. Hmm. They were, they never got penalty. They were supposed to even actually in one, in one iteration, they were supposed to be penalized and they never were. They were never taken to court. They were always hidden and helped like Brett Kavanaugh. Hello? Mm. <laughs> they were. I mean, it's it has it, it has not changed. Um, but 
they, but so you had, everybody else had a penalty except for white men. And actually mm-hmm. I have to say the only person who also was never brought up on charges or, or um, penalized um, legally for having sex outside of their race or outside of marriage were black women. Mm. Because black women were being raped on the regular right. as a matter of course, to breed more free labor. And the, and the earlier laws that you were mentioning actually was a law that was legalizing the violation of black women. Exactly. Exactly. I like how you put that. That's really true. So, so she, she is indentured and while indentured, she has children and her children also are indentured. Um, and they are indentured for 21 years and Mm. then they have children and no men are ever mentioned. So I decided to do a DNA match search to search for the, the surnames of their indenturers in my DNA. And it turns out they're here. Mm. Mm. I found pages of matches Mm. and that means 300 year old secret is found out that the men in the indenturing families raped mm. my seven times great grandmother mm. and six times great grandmother. Mm. Um, and for three generations, then we were indentured until finally we are free. We're free and we become free and own land and, um, and, and the children uh, the third generation, the children are actually moved away from their parents and they never really connect again. That's my theory. Um, we don't, we don't know how they got there, but most likely I think that they, we, they got to Virginia because Virginia is literally right across the river right. from where they were. And, um, there weren't that many fortunes around, so they were probably all the same family. So, so there's, um, there's, there's a lot that was uncovered through the research and it doesn't just stick with this one family. That's the first chapter. Right. And then you go into the second chapter, which is the Lawrence's and the third chapter, which is Leah Ballard, the last enslaved woman in my family. Now um, I would love for you to read a portion of the book and that Leah Ballard, because you do a beautiful job. I want people to understand that, um, this is not just a book that's just giving you a list of what I found. Mm. You place it in the narrative. You weave yeah. us back and forth historically of what I call the genealogical detective work, uh, along with what is happening mm-hmm. historically. And, and it's beautifully written. And if you would, I mean, I love the way you open up that chapter. Oh, open it. I was going to clo- do the closing. Yeah, but-, actually, but I just love the way you open up the chapter. It just... Oh. It, it, it is so it's beautifully written and it's so powerful that, you know, it just makes you want to keep turning the pages. Oh, well, you know what? Can I read the end, though? Can please, I read? The end? Is that OK? Because I love how I close the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, I want to I want to. Um, I want to, it'll be a little bit, it'll be like three pages. Is that okay for folks? Can folks kind of just like settle in? They can settle in there. They're good. That's people behind the scenes. Is everybody good back there? I think we're good. Okay. And let me just do this little quick commercial right now. If you'd like (laughs) to pick up a copy of Fortune, we want you to pick up a copy through Afriware. Afriware is Mm -hmm. the company that we utilize that manages our bookstore. They have several locations in Chicago. They are black owned and also sister owned. So we want you to use Afriware to purchase Fortune by Lisa Sharon Harper. Fabulous. Oh, thank you so much for that. Thank you, Afriware. (laughs) Fabulous. All right. So I'm going to read from, um, from a section that uh, well, I'm reading for the last from the last okay. two pages. Leah bore down and screamed her first daughter, Martha, into the world in 1865. Mm. Martha passed through the contractions of both mother and country. She breathed her first gulp, then a scream burst from her body a scream that equaled the terror of moving from the safety of the womb into a world ablaze. Martha Ballard was born to a woman who had known only slavery. Martha and her descendants would know only freedom to a point. 
Born as the Civil War folded to a close, there is no listing of Martha's exact date of birth. The 1880 census only discloses the year of her birth, 1865. Listed as one of nine mulatto children of Leah Ballard, neither mother nor child can be found on any census before 1880. Martha's first 15 years of life and Leah's plight, directly following emancipation, remain shrouded in mystery. Leah Ballard Ankrum Williams was a woman for whom the putrid taste of antebellum loss had become familiar. That loss followed Leah throughout the first 19 years, and its ghost haunted her in every generation till the day she died. The same year that Leah gave birth to Martha, our nation pushed the 13th Amendment from passage to ratification within 12 months. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. These words catalyze the reversal of the original Virginia laws established in 1662, as well as every race law that bound fortune and her descendants the laws that bound Henry and his brothers, and the South Carolina laws that shackled generations of Leah's family and would have bound them forever. I can only imagine Leah's family and, I, I'm sorry, I can only imagine Leah's tears and dancing on the day she learned she was free. Mm. To think of the joy now, my body cannot contain it. Leah would taste loss again. But for this moment, I imagine Leah standing still on the land she and her people had slaved for generations on the day she hears that she is free. Leah raises her face to the noonday sun. Mm. She looks up to the trees, the leaves blowing and swaying overhead. Leah remembers the sound of the spirit songs in the brush arbor. She remembers her mother's voice in the trees. She listens close and soon she hears the harmonies of her foremothers all the way back to the Yoruba and Hausa women. They sing to her from the trees. Put on your crown, child. Put on your crown. I came this night for to sing and pray, oh yes, oh yes, to drive old Satan far away, oh yes, oh yes, that heavenly home is bright and fair, oh yes, oh yes, but very few can enter there, oh yes, oh wait till I put on my crown, wait till I put on my crown, wait till I put on my crown, oh yes, Oh, yes. If you want to catch that heavenly breeze. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Go down in the valley on your knees. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Go bow your knees upon the ground. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And ask your Lord to turn you around. Oh, yes. Oh, wait till I put on my robe. Wait till I put on my robe. Wait till I put on my robe. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's beautiful. Uh, you do such an incredible job. I've mentioned it before to everybody. Lisa Sharon Harper is a writer and a poet and a playwright. And this book will bless you because you will get a great full context of, of our history, the triumph and the tragedy, uh, the horror and the hope. And weaving in is this amazing detective story that Lisa is in the middle. And if you can imagine a circle of all of these ancestors around her whispering as she is writing. Mm. And that was just a portion of fortune. And we would encourage you, everywhere books, uh, to pick up fortune for the commercial. There, there's a question that I have because I like the sequence in the book. Okay. Dances with Wolves. Dances yes! with Wolves ends up in the book because Dances with Wolves ends up creating this doorway for yes. you to enter into another conversation about a section of your family mm -hmm. and a conversation with your grandmother, I think, 
yes. is your grandmother because you asked her, why is your hair like that? Yes, I did. Whenever I went over to Grandma Lawrence's house, and this is Willa, Willie, her, she was born um, uh, Willie, but they actually, she changed her name to Willa later on in life. So whenever I went over to Grandma Willa's house, I would always sit on the back of the couch. I'd run and get the brush and I'd go sit on the back of the couch and she would sit between my knees and I would, you know, style her hair like you do, like a, a doll, like, you know, a hairdresser doll. And I, I really, that was one of my favorite things to do in, in life. And one day I asked her because on the playground at school, um, all the kids were talking about how I'm part Cherokee and I'm part Cherokee. And I didn't know, I was like, I don't know, you know, I know we're black, right? Cause that's what grandma always said. So one day I asked her, grandma, are we part Indian? And she said, we're black and that's it. And she, she, just put me in my place. I was not to ask that question anymore. And, and, and how I understand it. I understand where that came from for her. Her mother passed for white. Mm. Her mother, mm. Lizzie Johnson, when yes. she left the South in the great migration, she passed for white and left her behind because she was too dark. Mm. Right. So she was left behind to be raised for a, a, like a year or two with by Leah, the last enslaved woman. Mm -hmm. And and she had to work, work on the farm in order to earn her keep. And so she resented that and also had a real sense. We are black. Like she, mm -hmm. that's her experience is black. And so she told me we're black. Don't. And then I came back to her like the next week because they were still talking about it on the schoolyard. And because we always came over every weekend, Grandma. But 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 are are we any? Are we? Do we have any Native American? And she finally just relented and she said, "Okay, we are part Native American, but don't ever tell anybody because they'll think you're trying to pass for white." Wow. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't. I never told anybody. I never said a thing until I watched Dances with Wolves. And there was something in my spirit. I can't explain it. And I know it's kind of hokey because <laughs> I know a lot of people, a lot of people had this like, you know, I want to be Native American around that time. And everybody was getting the fringe and the leather, you know, coats right. and as if they were out on the plains. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, to this day, I, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is intentional. And that was what ended up being the point of chapter two was that identity was obscured by the colonizer mm -hmm. as a tactic of colonization mm. and not just obscured, but actually tried to be breeded out and legislated out. And so if it is true that um, that someone on my family was Native American, we are told that they were Chickasaw and Cherokee. And it is true that in the area where this lang, le, um, line of the family, the Lawrences were, they were Chick they were Cher Cherokees and Chickasaws in that area. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I'm just like, wow, well, that's that's coming, that's shaking out. And when I did the research into the people who lived around them on the census, I looked for those surnames, the surnames of the people who lived around them on the Dawes rolls, which are the final rolls that that are that that tell you who made it to Indian country, to Oklahoma. Say that, Oklahoma. say that name again so everybody can hear that, and we're going right. to put that in the chat. The Dawes Rolls, D-A-W-E-S, okay. right? Dawes Rolls. Okay. And so the Dawes Rolls became the way that the Cherokee Nation um, kept track of who is Cherokee anymore. And it never was that way before then. Before, before colonization, before the Trail of Tears, the way that the Cherokee, as I'm told by Cherokee elders who taught me, the way that identity was determined was whether or not the Cherokee people claimed you as their own. They had many people in the Cherokee nation who actually had not one lick of Indian blood, but they claimed them as their own. So they were Cherokee. They were Salagi. Because that was the way that the people, that was the actual name, Salagi. And so they were, they were, they were, they were, the, they were of the people. But no. once, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Go, go right ahead. There's a question that popped up in the chat that I, I'm going to, when you, when you finish, I'm going to ask you. Sure. But once they were colonized, 
they were removed from their land. Okay. From their land they had been on for like 13, 14,000 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, 14, 16,000 Cherokees were forced to walk 800 miles in a blizzard mind you, 4,000 of them died along the way. And their route went directly through the area that my ancestors lived, where they lived after that. They, they are nowhere to be found on the census before the Cherokee Trail of Tears, before 1840. But all of a sudden in 1850, they show up. They're like right there, right along the route in this like, and I, I went to the land up in these mountains. And it turned out that now native people who are actually members of the Cherokee nation and other, um, other removed nations from that area, they'll tell you a lot of people escaped the trail. Didn't never even went, they went up and hid in the Hills. But the way that the law came down was it said, if you escaped, you will no longer be able to be called Cherokee, to be a member of the Cherokee Nation. The only people who can be members of the Cherokee Nation are, one, you can trace your ancestry to someone who, who made it to the end, or you made it to the end, right? So you made it to the end, you write your name on the Dawes Rolls, you are Cherokee. Or you can trace your member. So in other words, your ancestor had to assent to colonization in order to remain Cherokee. And so because my ancestors, if our family story is true, did not assent to colonization, they mm -hmm. said, forget you, I'm staying. Well, on the, on the census documents, their identities, sorry, their identities change with the years. Then mm -hmm. in 18, 1870, they're listed as white. Um, in 1880, they're listed as mulatto. Mm. Um, or is it 1890? I think it's I think it's 1890. They're listed as mulatto, mulatto, and 1900 they're listed as black. You know, it's like so you see the progression. And get this, this is funny. Henry's brother's son, right? So Henry's nephew, around the turn of the century, lists himself as Ethiopian. Really? Yes. Around the same time that Ethiopia was winning its independence. He right. lifted himself as Ethiopian. So they are in a, they're in this shape shifting transformative space where race is being formed again after mm. the civil war, because also up the, 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 this marker of status before the civil war was slave or free. It had nothing to do with color of skin, right? It was just slave or free. But after the civil war, it becomes about white, black, mulatto, right? So it becomes now about skin shade and ability to pass, ability to be seen as safe, you mm. know, a safe Negro in the eyes of white people. That means you get more privilege, which is, you know, people who can pass. So identity is something that was obliterated. It was, it was erased um, in those in those years by the acts of colonization intentionally as a way to conquer us. That's powerful. That's powerful. I, I want to as there's a question that came up from Brenda Dixon. We're moving to the portion where you can ask questions. Brenda Dixon has a question. She just wants to know, are you reading the audiobook version of this? Yes. She said, OK, <laughs> Brenda's excited now because she said I've Hope so. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. Thank you, Brenda. Yes, I am. And it was it was awesome. I so all that theater stuff, all the theater training that I got comes out and we I try I tried my best to live it as I was as I was reading it. So, so if you want to book also audible.com, the book is available. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Sharon Harper has done a beautiful job. She is a voiceover artist and an <laughs> actress and a playwright. So you will be blessed by the reading uh, of the book. So we're opening up now. If you have a question, all you have to do is put it in the chat. We have people working in the background right now that will bring that information up. So whatever question you have for Lisa Sharon Harper, she is waiting to answer your question. Whatever it may be. Now, Can I just, sure. oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go on. 
No, I was going to ask you a question. I said, wow, yeah, please wow, do. We <laughs> There's something that I had had written down that uh, this idea, the doctrine of discovery in 1455 uh, and Pope Nicholas uh, V, it's Pope Nicholas yeah. V, yeah. I, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. that laid that out. But as an, a former or recovering or complicated relationship as an evangelical. Um, <laughs> That's a good way to put it, actually. It's a complicated relationship. Complicated relationship. I, kn I know your story. You've shared the story. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the doctrine of discovery inform the evangelical theology view of, of, of the world and of Jesus? Mm. Wow. That's, that's a question. Well, the doctrine of discovery comes out of the Catholic church, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and it also is based on a bad read of the text, right? So the text itself, Genesis 1 26 says that every human being is called to exercise dominion in the world. In fact, that's what it means to be human. What it means to be human is to be made in the image of God and given the call of God to exercise stewardship, excuse me, stewardship of the world. And so what Pope Nicholas V did was he failed to reference Genesis 126. Instead, what he referenced was Aristotle. Hmm. Aristotle in his book on politics right. says, he says, if you have been conquered, you have proven that you were created to be enslaved. Mm. Okay. So it's really interesting. In fact, in this conversation is where I'm making this first connection. So this could be, this could be wrong, but I'm going to share with you my first thought about mm. your, your question. You have this era called the era of Calvinism, like when Calvinism is first being developed mm -hmm. in Switzerland. And it's in a time where he's actually, it's also where when Adam Smith, well, Adam Smith comes up a little later, right? So um, Adam Smith is thinking about the marketplace and how the marketplace, you know, works for everybody. And, but he's also thinking about it in terms of election and mm -hmm. Calvinism is at the heart in fact, neo-Calvinism is at the heart of evangelicalism that is on the wrong side of justice mm. almost at every turn. And it's not to say that Calvin was a bad guy, but it's to say that neo-Calvinism is missing something. And the Calvinism is not, is not God, right? It's not, it's, it's fallible. He, this is a guy who had some thoughts in a particular context that meant something in that context, right. but it's not for everybody for all time. And I'm saying that I say that, you know, with fear interpretation, knowing some people are going to be really mad at me, but at the same time, knowing I'm right, because Calvin is not God. And and what he wrote was not the Bible. Say it again um, now. It's for the people. Calvin is not God, and he did not write the Bible. Hello, somebody. And in fact, he what he wrote worked in his context, but did not work to stop enslavement. Mm did not work to stop the slave trade. And no, Switzerland never had slaves, but Switzerland funded the, the slave trade. Right. They were major funders of the slave trade. And Calvin's, the, like the land of Calvin, Calvin's doctrines did not stop that from happening, did not throw a, like a monkey wrench in the, in the philosophy of those who did that. And Calvin's, um, Calvin's doctrines did not stop um, uh, the neo-Calvinists of the, of the 1800s mm -hmm. from breaking off from the church in order to keep having slaves. Right. So, so there's something wrong there. So you ask, you know, what does the doctrine of discovery have to do with evangelicalism? I think that it has to do with the fact that there is, um, there is, there are this doctrine of election, right? right? This doctrine of election, which is what Calvin was working with, he was thinking, he thought of predestination and there are the elect, the few who are called to be or who are created to, to actually enjoy heaven. Everybody else is going to hell, to hell in a handbasket, right? So if you have the doctrine of election and you think you are of the elect, well, that's exactly the mindset of the Pope, oh, when the Pope, yes, yes. when the Pope, uh, just, you know, said 
to his friend, the family friend who came to go, you know, get a blessing to go exploring when he went and said to him, uh, I'll give you a blessing. If you run across any uncivilized people, you can go ahead and take their land and enslave them. Why? Because they are obviously not of the elect. If you want to make those two things, that's, mm -hmm. it's the same thought just coming out of different branches of the church um, and at different times, but influenced by each other around the same time. Oh, that's good. That That is really good. Uh, again, you can ask your questions right now, place them in the chat. We will present those questions to, to, to Lisa Sharon Harper. Oh, here's a question from Harriet Dart. Uh, Thank you. Great. What is the Exodus text, which the Pope missed, misread? Yeah, it's not Exodus. It's Genesis. Okay. It's Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That's the text that says, um, where, where it's actually, you know, the high point of the mm -hmm. creation um, epic poem on the first page of the Bible, right? And it says, and then God said, let us make humankind in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. Mm -hmm. So those, there's three major words just in those, in that like one sentence that, that is um, right there. And it's, it is all once and it's all spoken in one breath in that text. Salem, is the word for image of God. Um, let us make humankind in our image. And that literally means representative figure. So mm -hmm. we human beings are created to be representative figures of where yeah. God is king, where God rules, where God reigns, right? Because you're thinking about this in terms of, well, God is the maker of the universe. God is supreme. God is the ruler. And God is now making us in God's image. The ancients understood the image of the king is a marker of where the king rules. Mm -hmm. So now we are the image of that king. We are markers of where God rules. So then let us make them in our image and our likeness. That's um, demuth, which means we are like God, but we are not God. Like God so right. It's a distinguishing um, and a distinguisher. And then, and let them have Radha. Radha is dominion. So dominion, people have said, means to dominate. It does not mean That's to dominate. That's a very English version of that. That's yes. Literally. Much. Literally. They, they carried that forward thinking that's what the text said to do, but right. it's it doesn't. That word comes in the, it literally means to tread down, which you would, you know, don't get it twisted. I can see how you would, because mm -hmm. to tread down feels violent, but it's in the context of the very, the very beginning, like the untamed wilderness that's growing up all over the place. And so to tread down means to keep it hemmed in, like maintain the wellness of the relatedness, the relationships between all creation, all created things. And in the next chapter, in chapter two, you have two words that are spoken there that give a great picture of what dominion looks like. The word is not used, but a good picture. So in, in when God places the human in the middle of the garden and says, till and keep it, those words, when you translate them from the Hebrew into English, they actually mean serve and protect. Right. Serve and protect. And so that's what Radha looks like. So in our, in, in, uh, in the English imagination of the world, you have to dominate the world in order to gain peace. Mm. Empire dominates in order to create peace right so, so they're not trying roman, to be, the whole roman-esque aspect yeah. is we bring peace through domination if the whole world is rome then you didn't have to worry about war that's exactly right exactly and the english had the same thought they literally had the same thought mm -hmm. and that's why they they relished you know that there was a point in history where the sun never set on on the british yeah. empire yeah they owned, they had conquered the world and they loved that because then they could have peace everywhere for themselves, right? Peace. They had peace because they were conquered, right. but the people who they conquered did not have peace, right? Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, so, so the, the Pope Nicholas V, when he, um, when he references, when he says, um, Anywhere you go, you can claim that land for the throne if these people are not civilized. What he's really saying is, if they're not civilized, they're not human. Hmm. And hmm. that is what Aristotle would have said. Mm -hmm. Aristotle argued that the barbarians, that's what he, he called them barbarians, are less than human.
And what's interesting is that the cons and, and this there's a lot of conflation. Uh, Harriet said, "Wow, Th thank you, Harriet." <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of conflation. So I love what uh, there's a, there's a scholar by the name of Clarice uh, Martin and a scholar by the name of Renita Weems mm -hmm. talks about the conflation of understanding of placing chattel slavery and early forms of slavery as completely equal hmm. and not understanding that yeah. you know, the Greek idea of slavery still gave you some agency. Oh yeah. Yes. And that's and important. citizenship. And mm -hmm. really there's all, all of the, there were laws of protection. And mm -hmm. she says that for the American mind, it's better when we are not talking when we're talking pre when we're well not pre 16 19 but really talking about ancient uh, periods that you should always say servitude and oh that's good so yeah that's right in your mind it's different mm -hmm. than chattel plus that's right that's exactly right and they i mean even when they were when they were bound to someone right mm -hmm. there was a time limit so that's it's it was more indenture than than slavery mm -hmm. that in perpetuity thing came along with us that was not with them it was right. not in perpetuity um and slavery, even in, on the continent of Africa, I mean, let's not get it twisted. This was not right. just an English or a European thing. We also enslaved each other. But it was also usually as because of an infraction against the society in the same way that we would have jail now or prison right. now. They did. They enslaved you to a family. But still, even then, you were treated as if you were human. You were able to have a family. You had you had a place in the society. You had rights. It and was it not the same based. thing. It wasn't. It wasn't socially constructed. It wasn't racially based. Right. Right. It's a brand new idea brought to the earth, and that's what yeah. conservatives today. I mean, I heard uh, what's his name? Is it Thomas Sowell? He was saying there's always been slavery. This talk about slavery, we should not raise the questions in which we're raising them because everybody's had slavery. And the response was, I think it was Cornell West. He mm -hmm. said, "Racial slavery is new in the human experiment." Yeah, <laughs> he right. said, "It's it's a new." phenomenon this is this is radically different than slavery that was during Paul's time hey they're oh. both problematic no without a doubt yeah. but racial slavery is something that this is you know people from a thousand years from now will look at us like we're insane like you know what were you doing what, what were, you, were doing? you thinking yeah yes and but you know what I mean look it was genius right because what they did was they united all the white folk in a way that it was not possible to be united before slavery. That's why, mm -hmm. right. That's why Derek Bell, um, founder, grandfather of, of um, critical race theory. That was his theory is that America needs black people in order to keep peace among the, the Europeans here. And in some ways I actually agree with him, but the reality is that for white people, they lost something huge in this bargain that they made to get whiteness for them to be white they had to do the same thing that was done to us they had to renounce their story they had to renounce their land oh, come their on. past their mm. grandma and great grandma and great great grandma mm. so most of them now when you ask you know do you know who your great grandma was they say no mm. they don't know because to be white is to be suspended in the middle of nothing because you don't have any roots and you're not tied to anything. You are a self-made man, mm. but you're not tied to your, even to your own mama, because most of them leave their parents and never come back. And so whiteness is about one thing. It's about power. Mm. Now, the thing, the reason why I think we have January 6th is because in 23 years, we are going to have a shift in our, right. we already have a shift, but it's going right. to be complete. In 23 years, America will be a majority people of color nation. Mm. And very soon after that, you are not going to have the assumption of white leadership anymore. Mm. In fact, that's already happening. Mm. You don't have the assumption of white leadership. So you have had for 500 years now, you have had the assumption of white leadership. And, and you threw away, you tossed your history. You renounced 
your land. You renounced your great grandma. You renounced your family story and you never taught that to your children. Instead, you bought the lie that you are white and you bought the lie that what it means to be human is to have two cars and two and a half kids and, um, and, and a C, a C suite, you know what I mean? Like to achieve, that's what it means to be human in the white imagination. Uh But now when you come up against the next 23 years and you are no longer going to be the assumed leader, who are you then? Mm. Who Mm. are you then? Which is why in the book, I charge both us African-Americans and people of African descent around the world and people of European descent to do the family history work. Mm -hmm. Both of us, both of us have actually been severed from our peoples, mm. severed from our histories, severed from our actual cultures, severed from our stories, and made to be suspended in thin air on this ghost string called blackness and whiteness. Mm. We you need to be rerouted. Lisa Sharon Harper. Uh, I got a text from uh, Monica. She said, this lady's bad to the bone. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Sister. Now, now, it's interesting because, you know, a friend of ours, uh, Reverend Jim Wallace, uh, he, he he spoke at uh, Trinity several years ago. Oh, wow, and, cool. and in a conversation he shared, he said that, I found out about whiteness. He said, when I left America Mm. as a white man and I landed in Europe Mm. and they asked me my ethnicity. But when I came back to America, I was white again. Yes. He said in Europe, they want to know, are you Scottish? That's right. Or are you Irish? Yes. Uh, who, Who are your people? Yes. No one asks what? me who my people are in America. No. They say, I get to be white wherever I go. And the privilege, he said, the privilege of whiteness is never having to think about your whiteness. That's exactly right. You don't have to think about it because everybody, everything is made for you. Yep. For you to stand on top of. So nobody thinks about the ground. You don't think about mm. the ground. You walk on the ground. Well, they walk on whiteness, so they don't have to think about it. Oh, that image right there. Okay, that's the next book for Lisa Sharon Harper. To walk, walk on whiteness. <laughs> that's it. That's it right there. Oh, Lord. Okay, I'm writing that down. Somebody text me with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. The publisher, I'm tell your publisher, walking on whiteness. That, that's it right there. I'm writing that down. Now we have Carla. Carla said whiteness is about power and denomination, uh, domination, dominance. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank that's you. Right. That's exactly right, Carla. Whiteness, it's not white people. It's the political construct of race. And, you know, we say, we say, and mainly because it's been coming out of the social work or the sociology realm, it's a social construct. Yes, but not really. Mm -hmm. It is fundamentally a political construct. Yes. Politics is the conversations that we have and the decisions that we make about how the polis will live together, how the people will live together. And we constructed a legal way that the people will live together in the political realm. So mm. when we when we say that it's a social construct, I actually think we do ourselves a disservice, disservice because then we make it all about, well, you know, I just need to feel better about black people. I just need to forgive. I just need to, you know, I need to listen to more stories and read more books. And then that will make the, 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 the world better. No. <laughs> yes. You do need to do that because it has become a social construct. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, it is socially enforced for sure, but it doesn't end there. And that's where we have really missed the boat for decades in this conversation it is a political construct. Mm. It is laws. It is the the fe- the um um the Federal Housing Authority when it was formed yes. in 1933, right? right? Talk about this in the book. In 1933, they formed the Federal Housing Authority, formed by a segregationist. Right. So when he writes the law, he writes it in a way that says that if there is one black person, one person of African descent living in a community then all of the land value in that community goes down. 
So now that you just is a quoted, le- so that people know this, what you just quoted is critical race theory. I'm not trying to be, no. f- I'm not trying to be funny, but no, it's real. Derek Bell class examined that specific issue and the construction of the housing authority yeah. redlining and how baked into the law is this idea of yeah. race. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and, and, and so I just, I just had to mention that for those who are confused, yes. uh, that's what the, we were talking about. Yes, exactly. And so you see, in fact, it's funny because again, it intersects with my family story in this weird way that I didn't expect. Um, the Dashiell family were next door neighbors to Betty Game. And um, Betty Game, uh, she bought land from um, the son of her indenturer. I don't know how that all happened. That's part mm. of the story. I don't know yet. But she ended up living on this land that she was eventually run off of because as the as the 1700s progressed and we got closer and closer to the Revolutionary War, um, enmity um, against people of African descent, especially free ones, just went to a fever pitch in Maryland. And um, b- free black people ended up fleeing mm. Maryland and going over into Delaware and also into Virginia in order to find freedom find the ability to live free. So Betty ended up going into this undeveloped kind of swampland area where a lot of black folk ended up moving and setting up their community in Delaware. So, but she lived next to the Dashels. She was next door neighbors to the Dashels. Now fast forward several generations and you get the turn of the century where another Dashel is now um, a city councilman and he writes the very first um, redlining law in the nation. Mm. In Baltimore, in Baltimore. Wow. And in, in, in his, his redlining ordinance then catches on throughout the entire South and North and becomes kind of the law, the way that things, the, the way that things work. And so redlining FHA, the FHA homeowner thing, which actually then moves people and of course you would, if you're going to have one black person in your neighborhood and all the land value is going to go down. I just bought a house. I don't want my land owner, my land value to go down. Mm-hmm. You're going to sign some community covenants, right? If you're going to, if you don't mind being in justice light, you're going to do that to save the value of your home. So I understand the logic, the social nature that the law creates the social um, racialization of our communities that the law prompted. Um, And then you have eminent domain, eminent domain where cities and governments come in and actually snatch land. And that happened on two separate streams of our family. My, my great, my, my first great grandfather, Hiram Lawrence, Henry's son, uh, moved to Philadelphia and owned eventually a block of homes, Mm -hmm. like a whole block of homes in Elmwood, Philadelphia. Yes. This little swampy, like marshy, not swampy, but marshy area on the outskirts of Philadelphia. And then a city came and stole it and forced him to sell it to them for pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And he was only with that money able to buy one house, Mm. one block from where I'm sitting right now, Mm. where three generations of our family lived in that one house. And so that's how that's how our wealth was never able to be accumulated and how we get now white people having 10 times the wealth right. of people of african descent and your book i mean when you come to the close dealing with and you are a reparations person i want everybody to know that lisa yes. harper has been doing the work in reference to to reparations and i do not want to miss this mm-hmm. for everyone who is listening You've heard the brilliance of of Lisa Sharon Harper, uh, the CEO, founder, and Imagineer of Freedom Road. Uh, Trinity United Church of Christ is partnering with Freedom Road. Uh, this summer, you know, we are going on a very special pilgrimage yes. to Charleston, South Carolina. You will have the opportunity to hear some of this brilliance. We are connecting uh, with some of the scholars, local storytellers. We're looking at food. We're looking at faith. We're looking at resistance. Mm-hmm. If you're interested and there's some spaces open, I believe there's a waiting list now, 
But yep. if you'd like to have information about what Freedom Road is doing, uh, you can go to their website and look at all of the wonderful programming uh, they are doing. We also want to announce tonight, you're going to be hearing more information about two scholarships for college students uh, that we are sponsoring. Uh, myself and Monica uh, and Trinity United Church of Christ, that we want a young person uh, to have this experience. And for depending upon where you are in school, uh, you will be able to get credit for this uh, because you have some of the top scholars in the country uh, for this experiential trip to Charleston, South Carolina, to the Gullah Territory, to a place where 50 percent of people of African descent landed. Mm -hmm. So more than likely, one out of two people who go on this trip who are people of African descent, mm -hmm. you have a lineage that goes directly to South Carolina. That's pretty extraordinary. It's, that's yeah. pretty extraordinary. And they're building a museum. And I might add, uh, she's no longer there, but uh, one of the first curators of the museum, Joy Bivens, uh, was in our sanctuary choir and left uh, Chicago to make her way to Charleston, South Carolina, to oh, help wow. them build uh, this new museum. She's now in New York, uh, where she is at the Schaumburg. Uh, but we we are just have some wonderful connections uh, with with Charleston and the new African American Museum of Genealogy, uh, where they are building a database for people of African descent so you can do what Lisa Sharon Harper has been doing in her book. Yes. This has been an extraordinary conversation. You know, I say, I always say Lisa Sharon Harper yes. I'll say this time, um, but I always, <laughs> I always call Lisa by her full name all the time. True. <laughs> you have to say Lisa Sharon Harper. You just can't say Lisa. You have to say Lisa uh. Sharon Harper. It, it has been an extraordinary conversation. Uh, Fortune is a book everyone should have on their bookshelf. You can pick it up through Afroware Books. Go to afroware.com. We encourage you. This is Black History Month, y'all. You should be spending your money with a black company. All right. <laughs> and this is a sister owned. This is a black woman magic company. Uh, that manages even our, our bookstore at Trinity, but they also have another location in Oak Park uh, here in the Chicagoland area. So we want you to pick up a copy, share with your friends. If you are a teacher, this is a great book for you to use with your class to talk about African-American history, to talk about gender, to talk about profit, to really talk about uh, the American project, in the words of Du Bois, the yet to be United States of America. Mm. How, bro how race broke my family and the world and how to repair it. Uh, this is the first of mm. our conversations known as book notes. I wanna thank none other than Lisa Sharon Harper for being with us to kick <laughs> us off uh, for this conversation. Our next book notes conversation will be with Shaka Senghor. That will be on February 20th. And we are moving that time to 6 p.m. 6 p.m. We'll be dealing with the book, Letters to the Sons of Society, A Father's mm. Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. He's the best-selling author of Writing My Wrongs. If mm -hmm. you would like to learn more about Shaka Senghor, I would invite you to go to YouTube and look up his TED Talk. It's one of the most viewed TED Talks where he talks about going from incarceration to transformation mm -hmm. and making this deep commitment to being the kind of man, father, and husband he has been called to be. I, I have so enjoyed, we have been talking prior to uh, we find out that we are kindred spirits in terms of the music and movies we like. <laughs> and it's been a great uh, opportunity to get to know Shaka Senghor a little bit uh, uh, more as we have been as we've been talking. We are sponsoring this uh, with several other organizations. 
and we're looking forward to that conversation. Coming up in March, we will be talking with Dr. Earl Fisher, uh, whose dissertation is about uh, the Reverend Albert Clegg, who wrote The Black Messiah, the founder of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, mm. or an African Orthodox Christian denomination uh, that is connected to Ethiopia, but comes out of uh, the Black Power Movement. And then we will end our, our book notes series uh, with none other, uh, our friend, our good friend, Jackie Lewis. Yay. Love. There's no <laughs> one like Jackie Lewis. Uh, she is a wonderful, powerful leader in New York who is the pastor, the first uh, African-American uh, pastor, first woman uh, to be a pastor of Middle Church uh, in, in New York City. That church recently uh, was burned down. It's one of the oldest buildings in New York, and they are rebuilding that community in an mm -hmm. extraordinary way. Uh, mm -hmm. So don't miss our book notes. You're going to have the opportunity to talk with some of the most brilliant thought leaders uh, in our nation. And tonight uh, you had the opportunity to speak with, and I'm proud to say, my friend, Lisa Sharon Harper. And we mm -hmm. want you to pick up the book, Fortune. Again, Afriware Books, uh, we want you to support uh, a sister as she's doing a great job across the Chicagoland area, Sister Nzinga. Uh, sharing information and making sure people have knowledge of self, if I may break mm -hmm. it down like five percenters, uh, knowledge of self. So thank you all for being with us. I want to give a major shout out uh, to uh, the tech wizard, Sister Cleo. We thank you so very much. The Uber producer, better known as Inla, and uh, the supervising producer, Donna Hammond of the Chicago Southside Hammonds, uh, who've been doing a great job behind the scenes. We appreciate you all very much. And we thank you for being with us tonight for Book Notes.